Um, so I'm going to talk about AI and skin cancer diagnosis. So we can think about AI as being artificial or augmented intelligence, and we can apply this. We normally think about applying it to images of lesions that are suspicious for skin cancer, but really it can be used for anything, for inflammatory lesions. We can use it to apply to things like genetic profile. The basic principle of AI is that you have a training set where you have a known diagnosis, you train a computer, um, it will We'll, we can train it on features we know, or we can sort of let the computer identify and pick the features that it has found to be good differentiators, and then we um, and then we test this on a new set of non-overlapping images. And generally, when we're talking about skin cancer, we'll either get a benign, malignant watch uh, biopsy or a sort of a, a more linear scale of you know, benign to malignancy. So how does AI differ from what we do as dermatologists? So you know, a machine can only look at what we put it on. Um, we as dermatologists have you know, um, other factors. So we can look at the patient's history. Um, we can look at their other skin lesions. We you know, generally will look at uh, the patient's entire skin, whereas um, the, the machine is really limited to just what we choose or what the patient chooses, meaning if you uh, look at the Seb K on the arm, but ignore the melanoma on the back, the machine never had the chance to take a look at that. Machines are objective, so they're not, they don't lose sleep over missing uh, skin cancers like we do. Um, and they also, you know, we tend to favor missing, um, we tend to favor over biopsying benign lesions over missing skin cancer. And machines will really only do um, what we tell them to do based on the thresholds that we set. Um, on by, you know, however, machines, you can train a classifier in a day to be pretty good at finding skin cancer, whereas it takes us years. And um, in terms of the features that have, are evaluated, we can say, I'm going to biopsy this because um, it meets these ABCD criteria, or I see this feature. Um, machines often, particularly with the neural networks that are used, um, you really can't look and say, why was that considered to be malignant? Um, so, you know, when I first started in this was actually doing clinical trials for this device, Melifind, um, which w is now something that I think a lot of us were excited about, but not something that we use. So I think we learned some lessons from it, however. Um, you know, one is that sensitivity comes at the cost of specificity. So we can see here what this translates to is a machine that told us to biopsy 90% of the things that we evaluated, which ends up potentially not being particularly clinically useful. It's an expensive machine. It had up all the optics all within this um, device that had to sit in your office. Um, and it, because of the way that the FDA approval uh, uh, process works, which we'll talk about, um, this has a fixed classifier, meaning that you can't learn and change it over time without going through FDA reapproval. So this is no longer available. Kind of the next step that I thought was exciting was this paper that came out in Nature. Um, and this was looking at using deep neural networks to classify images. And this was just images. This could be run on a computer. This could be clinical images. It could be dermatoscopic images. Trained on over 100,000 uh, skin, skin uh, lesion images, also with inflammatory disease. And in this study, um, they compared the accuracy of the machine to the accuracy of dermatologists. However, um, um, this was really set up to say, is this melanoma or a nevus, or is this a, a non-melanoma skin cancer or a Seb K, but didn't really have to make some of the tough decisions like, is that a Seb K or a melanoma? And then the dermatologists were just asked, would you biopsy this, yes or no? And we can see here that this is um, you know, different looking at how this performed compared to dermatologists for carcinomas on the left, and then melanomas with clinical images, and then um, in the middle, and with dermatologists on the right. And so if there is a red dot above the curve, that means that the dermatologist outperformed the machine. Below means the machine outperformed the dermatologist. And green is the average. So we can see here, on average, that the machine actually was uh, outperformed most dermatologists. Um, however, there's a little, you know, con concerning factors here. Like I think dermoscopy helps me be a better diagnostician, um, but we could see performance was actually worse with dermatoscopic images here. 
Um, and this is, you know, other groups have done this. So this is the ISIC challenge. So this is, uh, this is a study from 2019 um, where uh, several groups of um, investigators were um, invited to develop an algorithm um, and then um, they could test their algorithm on a new set of lesions and compare it to the performance of um, dermatologists. And so what we can see here is that um, if you look at the top three algorithms on the bottom and you look at all the human readers or expert human readers on the top two levels, on the top two lines, um, you can see here that most of the, the top algorithms really did outperform dermatologists and even expert dermatologists. Um, and, so, um, and so this was, you know, it's kind of interesting proof of concept that there's lots of different ways to get at this, but we can have dermatologists like accuracy with computers using just simple, uh, you know, generally dermatoscopic images. Um, but, you know, a couple caveats to think about when you read this is, you know, what um, we're generally trying to compare um, a human in performance with a reader study um, and versus, uh, versus a machine. But there's a lot of factors that are going to biopsy that when you look at these studies to consider. So, you know, um, in general, the ratio of melanomas to total lesions is going to change the kind of bio the, our assessment of should I biopsy this or not, and none of them are going to mimic what we see in clinical practice. Um, how much information you have. Do you have a lot of history? Do you just have a dermatoscopic and a clinical image? How good are the images? How difficult are they? Um, and so, and realizing that, you know, are you trying to have the best performance on paper? Or is, and is that the decision you would make if you actually had that patient in front of you? So, you know, on this, these are all melanomas on this slide. Some of these are very easy. Some of these are a little more challenging. Um, so what I do, and this is just sort of a list of different reader studies, and you can see sensitivities and specificities are all over the board. So um, while this is, I think, helpful in evaluating technologies, I think one of the ways that I look at this as being most helpful is sort of as a barometer of how complicated are the images that are being tested and being evaluated by the machine. So if a dermatologist, if our sensitivity is close to 100%, those might be a little bit easier, whereas if it's 70%, those are probably more challenging. Um, the other issue is that, you know, most of the early technologies focused on is this melanoma, yes or no, but as we just learned, um, most of what we see is in, in terms of skin cancer is actually not melanoma. Um, and uh, squamous cell carcinomas and even basal cell carcinomas can have a lot of um, morbidity or mortality. So this is kind of the next generation of um, tools, which is not just saying, is this melanoma, but actually looking to say, is this skin cancer? So this is one device that's being being used in the UK um, in a primary in primary care setting, but essentially the way that this and this is really just on a smartphone in a dermatoscope. The way that this device is um, evaluating a lesion is, is it's first saying, "Is this melanoma?" And if it's not, then well, it, might this be squamous cell? Could this be basal cell? So this is giving you a probability or sort of a, a assessment of malignancy, where it is specifically looking at all of the different um, potential. Diagnoses, and we can see here um, that you know what it. The purpose of this is for it to um, say, should this patient now be evaluated by a physician? Um, so because this is you know not being used as a device in the U.S. and because it's being tested in in the U.K., the the also you know as opposed to something like Melafine that's a standalone of device, this allows you to tweak your algorithm. So this is looking at you know um, the software update, um, looking at performance seeing that, you know, you can increase, as you learn with more and more images, increase sensitivity, improve uh, specificity over time. This also can be done, you can use um, AI not just on images, this is an example of a device that does elastic scattering spectroscopy. So this is, this measures the, um, uh, that measures scattering within a lesion and then uses neural networks to classify those as benign or malignant. And so the, and this is just a device that sits, it doesn't show you a picture, it just sits on top of the, of the lesion. Um, so this is being developed with the idea that this could potentially be used in a primary care 
care setting to help triage lesions that need to be either biopsied or sent for dermatologic referral. And so this is um, data from a couple posters that have been published. Um, and so we can see here the sensitivity of the device is around 95% compared to PCP sensitivity on the same lesions, um, which was 83%. It was improved. The specificity was about 20% positive predictive value of 16%, negative predictive value of 97%. So not missing a lot of skin cancers um, and saving some biopsies. Interestingly, using the same device on lesions that were um, biopsied because a dermatologist thought they were suspicious of melanoma, you see a similar sensitivity, but actually a higher specificity. So the quality of sort of that first pass and who chooses the lesions is going to impact um, performance in what we see. Um, so we have criteria now, um, you know, there's a lot of these studies that you can find in the literature and, you know, much like now if you think about clinical trials for atopic dermatitis or psoriasis, we have standard inclusion criteria, um, standard ways that we do studies. We didn't really have that in AI. So now there's consensus guidelines on how we should, you know, how we should be um, using the images that we use for training, for testing, and how we should be doing these studies. So there was concern, for example, that there's a lot of lack of image standardization, there's potential for bias. Um, so, you know, um, this can really impact um, the, it, the applicability of a technology to our patients. So this was looking at images that are out there and used in training devices and, you know, the metadata. So what do we know about the patient from whom that came? And a lot of times we know things like sex and age. Um, interestingly, in you know, looking at over 100,000 images, a lot of times we don't have histopathology. So we might be training something based on uh, somebody's assessment of, I think this is benign or malignant, without pathology. That's going to obviously be a little lower quality than something in which the, um, we know the biopsy. And then ethnicity and Fitzpatrick skin type is rarely available. So we need to think about the applicability on these. Um, the next kind of class is now, um, the, you know, we all have smartphones, and um, we did this study years over, almost a decade ago now, looking at the accuracy of um, smartphone applications for skin cancer diagnosis, and found really um, apps one through three were the ones that were automated, four was a store and forward teledermatology um, uh, device or, or uh, app, and we can see here that the sensitivity was actually quite low, but these were out there available for the general public to use. And again, using the dermatologist as sort of the how hard were these lesions, 90, the sensitivity with teledermatology was 98%, so not that hard. This, uh, this study, a similar study was actually repeated recently by the Memorial Sloan Kettering Group, and they found, again, a lot of missed melanomas on apps that are still available. This is from our study. These are examples of things that were considered benign by one or more app. Um, and I, I played around with this a little bit recently using two moles that are benign on me and then one that's an obvious melanoma, running it through some um, three different available apps. And you can see here that, you know, in general, my really benign mole on my arm, most thought were benign, but one of them was only 71% sure. This is on what's a pretty obvious melanoma. The assessments ran from maybe benign to 100% concerning. And then this is more my intermediate one, and that ran from, you know, a little bit concerning to not concerning at all. So, you know, a lot of variability out there, and these are still available. Um, we talk, started this session talking about the FDA. I'll kind of um, wrap up on the FDA, too. Um, so FDA ha actually does have oversight of AI devices, and this has kind of been an ongoing conversation with a, a panel meeting recently. So devices are classified by risk, with one being low, two being moderate, and three being being high. The devices that are currently approved, which were Melafine and then another one called um, Nevisense, those are considered class three de devices, meaning that they, re they require this full approval. There was a, a, a you know, discussion of changing this to class two. Interestingly, the companies that make this and the AAD oppose that. Um, and then there's a lot of discussion of how do you validate these. Um, and so what about, you know, mobile apps? So the FDA has said um, a, an app that analyzes um, a skin lesion and provides the user with an assessment of risk is something that they actually feel they should be overseeing, although right now these are available without FDA oversight. 
Um, kind of another interesting aspect of all of this is that, um, as you know, I think last year when I was here, I talked about this piece of tape, which is a, a pigmented lesion assay that takes a little bit of genetic material and gives an assessment of is this likely to be benign or malignant. This is Navisense, which is the FDA approved tool on my left, and then the middle is sort of your basic um, smartphone applications. These are all telling you the same thing. Do I think this is benign? Do I think this is malignant? Interestingly, if you do it with a device, that is, has oversight by the FDA. If you do it by looking at gene expression, there is no FDA oversight. So I think these are interesting questions as we move ahead with what to do. You know, what are other things that actually don't count as medical devices in which ARI is being used? Um, so this is, you know, a tool from uh, that Meta Optima where it doesn't, instead of saying this is benign, or malignant, um, you put in your image and it says here are 10 that look like it. You can look at the diagnosis of those 10, decide what's most like it, kind of like having a quick textbook and, um, and make a decision. So this is not considered a medical device. This is um, a tool in which, um, again, you can look at pictures of the back. AI can be used to pick out a new or changing lesion and point it out to the doctor without saying this is benign or malignant. That would not be considered um, a medical device using the by those. Um, now this is something this is really sort of in the research um, phase, but I, I thought this was interesting. Um, this is using AI to um, look at pictures of the back and and um, look at just these macroscopic images and find lesions that are considered suspicious or not, also to compare to, the, uh, to each other to identify ugly ducklings. Um, you know, would this, would this be considered a, a device? I think we need more research on it, but I think this kind of gives us an idea of where the field is going. Um, so, you know, in conclusion, how, how, where might this, you know, fit in in the future? I think that patients uh, potentially, would they do, but maybe they'll have, they'll have access to more accurate smartphone apps where they can look at their own moles. Um, Non-dermatologists potentially will have tools that can help them in triaging what needs to be sent to us. And then we will potentially have tools that help us with finding the very complicated skin cancers um, or potentially um, speeding up our skin exams by helping us to um, decide which nevi to focus on. So, you know, this is an example of a tool in which a macroscopic image can be evaluated. If it's considered suspicious, then dermoscopy can be used, and then you can sort of use that to triage, you know, if, if the patient should be referred at all and if they should be fast-tracked or not. Another application is potentially screening through um, with teledermatology in this study. Um, they found that, that um, in general, dermatologists were more accurate, but um, skin cancers were unlikely to be missed. So in conclusion, we've got lots of um, tools with dermatologist level sensitivity. We ought to think about how we're going to use them, how they're going to best fit in our practice, and how we make sure that they're inclusive of all of our patients. Um, so thank you very much.